Our next speaker, Cather Simpson, joins us from New Zealand, where she is the director of the Photon Factory and professor of physics and chemistry at the University of Auckland. Her research explores the interaction of light with matter, particularly how materials can convert light into more useful forms of energy. Cather is a leader in exploring how recent advances in the physics of light may transform our ability to feed the planet safely and sustainably. Please join me in welcoming Cather Simpson. So I am a university professor, as, um, as she said, and that means I teach a lot of people who are just slightly older than you. So I tend to teach classes that are like first year chemistry, first year physics. If any of you guys go into science of any sort, um, if you've got general education requirements, you'd be sitting in a large classroom similar to the ones that I lecture in. And one of the questions I often get asked is, why should I become a woman in science? Like, why? What's in it for me? And so I thought I would come up with a kind of, oh, top 10 reasons to be a woman in science. Um, and these are uh, a little bit, um, well, we'll just go through them. So, <laughs> number 10, science is male-dominated. And man, those hot guys, right? I mean, that guy up there on the upper, your left, he's not too bad, but he turned into that guy over there, right? Um, so this is kind of a joke, um, but this is real. So the very first time I ever got invited to give a presentation in my field, which is chemical physics, um, that's the invited speaker list. So they got all the invited speakers together and said, let's take a picture. Can you identify me? Yeah. So at this conference, this is one of those conferences where you go out and, and you have dinner with people and they bring their partners with them. And every time I'd sit down, the woman sitting next to me would say, oh, so what do you do? And I would say, well, I'm a scientist, right? She just assumed, or he, that I was a married to the person I was sitting next to. So I always sat next to the best looking one. <laughs> I'll let you figure out which one that is. Um, actually, the thing about this is that I now work with quite a number of those guys. And some of them are my best friends. You know, I can go to them, they support me. They write letters when I want to be promoted or get an award. One of those guys wrote a letter that helped me become a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand this year. And so maybe what I should be thinking about these days is about the allies. So people are becoming much more aware, men in particular are becoming much more aware that women are on a different playing field when it comes to science and engineering than they are. And they're becoming much more comfortable at helping lift us up, at helping level out that playing field. The explosions, number nine. How many of you guys love explosions? I should say only one of these should you do at home, and I hope you know which one it is. Um, <laughs> lithium and water in, in the middle, don't do that. And of course, the fire on the table. Very exciting, but maybe not in the right way. This is my favorite explosion. So I worked at Sandia National Labs as a scientist when I had just gotten my PhD. And it turns out this experiment was going on on the same facility, uh, uh, and I didn't know about it. And if I had, I would have leapt over. What you're looking at there is generation of x-rays and plasma. So you take, essentially, you plug something into the wall, you charge up these big old capacitors, and then you discharge them through the little tiny wires that she's putting in that sort of spool of thread. Each one of those wires is about the, a tenth the size of a human hair, and her job was to go in and line them up and put them through there, and you put all that charge through, and that picture is just the electrical discharge. It's just the fluff. That's not even the main amount of energy. Very, very cool. So this is about things like generating fusion so that we have more electricity that's, that's, um, that's more green. Um, very, very exciting. So explosions, very cool. The science is amazing. Oh, recognizing bias. How many, how many of you guys have experienced some sort of bias? Oh, look at that. See, this is what gives me hope for the future. When I was your age, I was the only girl in my entire baseball league there were parents that would say, get that B word off the field. And I still would have told you I didn't experience bias. There was no gender bias in my life. So the thing that gives me hope is that you guys recognize it. My kids who are 17, both boys, they recognize it. How do you recognize bias? Well, <laughs> like this. So sometimes it's really easy. 
You know, you look at an advertisement for your, your lab coat and it's like, yeah, I look really good in my lab coat. You would never see a man's lab coat advertised this way or this way, right? I mean, this is pretty easy to recognize. This one's pretty easy to recognize too. You know, so here's a Nobel Prize winner that in 2015 basically said, I don't want women in my lab because first of all, I fall in love with them or they fall in love with me. And then if you criticize them, they cry. Oh my God, he said this at a women in science thing. Older than you guys, but oh my goodness, what a nut job, <laughs> right? There are things like this and patronizing. You know, you get somebody that pats you on the head and says, oh, good job trying that really hard math, you know? Um, but I tell you what, people recognize it. You guys recognize it, we recognize it, men recognize it. He lost almost every position he held because of what he said. And that is so much more common, and the Me Too movement is making it even better, okay? Recognizing bias is the only way to defeat it. When I got hired, I was hired with Mary Barkley. She was a senior person, and I was just straight out of um, my postdoc, so I was like 25 or something. And I got hired into this chemistry department at Case Western Reserve, just across the way from you guys, um, in Cleveland. And we were the first women ever to be hired in our department. And this is what they put in, this, in the newspaper. You know, they hit the jackpot. And one of my colleagues from, uh, from the medical school called up and was like, is she single? And I'm thinking, no, you're supposed to be calling up and saying, what kind of great science does she do? Can I collaborate with her? Right? But I tell you what, Mary Barkley became the head of that same department. And I now direct a laser lab that has $25 million in funding, 50 people working in it. We do spin-out companies, we work for the dairy industry, we do laser stuff right at the fundamental science. How does energy get transmitted from light to molecular degrees of freedom? It's really, really fantastic. And this guy, I love this guy. So he's also a Nobel Prize winner. Won the Nobel Prize in Physics. He's now the Vice Chancellor at the Australian National University in Canberra. He came to our university last year and he gave a talk. He is considered a male champion of change because his goal as vice chancellor is to level the playing field across, okay? So one of the things about this, you know, number, I forget what we're on, seven or eight, recognizing bias, is that we all have biases too. This is not a male problem. And he said a really interesting thing at this uh, presentation. He said, you know, I want equal opportunity at every level within my university. I want women to have the same opportunities and the same uh, um, success stories in engineering and science as men do. And I want to have in my executive assistant pool the same opportunities for men. Ooh. Executive assistants are almost always women. If you go into most universities, uh, most facilities, even the Perimeter Institute, you're much more likely to find a woman in a staff position than you are in an academic position, right? And so somebody after the talk actually went up to him and said, well, if you want to open up opportunities in executive assistant positions for men, won't that undermine women's ability to succeed there? And he just paused, right? Because that's what they used to say about women. Women used to take, oh, we, you're gonna take a, a man's job and he won't be able to support his family. And so for me, that was a moment where I realized I had a bias. I also had been slightly uncomfortable. I'm like, holy crap, that's like when I get on an airplane and I'm a little bit surprised when the man goes out and serves coffee and the woman goes and flies the plane. It doesn't mean that I think that women shouldn't fly planes, it just means that inside, without thinking about it, I have underlying biases. The only way to get rid of those is to understand them and acknowledge them and learn about them. And that's what he's trying to do. So learning about bias, okay, that's not very exciting. This one I like a lot. Man, if you're a woman in science, this is changing, and, and I'm glad it's changing on some level, but on another level, I like being able to go into a physics conference and not have to wait in line at the bathroom. This is a science fair, and those guys on the, that side, the right, <laughs> are all waiting in line for the bathroom, and look at her, she's like, ha-ha. Because <laughs> how many times do you go to the mall and it's like there's only four stalls and there's a line, or the airport, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> uh, you get to work with animals. How many of you guys like animals, like the idea of working with animals? Mostly they're dead. <laughs> but that's okay, that's okay. So this is the colossal squid. 
This is the colossal squid, and this is actually in the museum, uh, the National Museum in uh, New Zealand, which is where I live now. And it, um, a fisherman caught it, and it died. They kept it on ice, and they're getting to study it. My very first research project was looking at how um, immunoglobulins, antibodies, the things that give us immunity from diseases, how they get across the gut lining. So in some mammals, you get your initial immunity from your mother's milk. And inside the intestinal lining is a receptor that changes its shape with pH. And that was fascinating. I was basically two, three years older than you guys. And I got to study how that works in real animals. Very, very cool, make a big difference. It can be a really good life. Being a scientist, being an engineer, being a doctor, all of those fields, you're very well trained. People want you. You have control a bit over your schedule. Even if you're a member of, say, a technical staff at a research lab or something like that, or a national laboratory, there are now rules in place about maternity leave and so on. These are my kids. So I have two boys. They're actually your age now, and I like these pictures because they're teenagers, and this reminds me why I love them. <laughs> but, you know, we've had a great time. And, and I've had the ability to have kids to raise a family and be a kick-ass scientist, which is what I love. Yay. <laughs> okay, so some people don't think that scientists or engineers, sh you should use the word geek or nerd, that somehow that's bad. But actually, I'm like, embrace it. You know what I mean? I'm not worried about being cool. I'm worried about learning all kinds of fun things and doing all kinds of fun things. And so if you have pictures like this in your past, so this is me in like first grade, I'm in the math league, woo! You know, um, then embrace it, go for it, you know? Here's a guy, um, his name's Jake Martin, he's now getting his PhD at Cambridge. Um, that's his wife, so she was also working in our lab, and he proposed to her by using our lasers to write, Louise, will you marry me? That, you know how tall that is? That's smaller than the diameter of the average human hair. And he was so excited that he took a laser out to dinner, so he developed this, he had this whole plan, he took her out to an island and blah, blah, blah. He had a laser, and you see that little, the top of the Y? It's got all that nanostructure in it. When you put a laser on it, it sprays it like a hologram. Her only comment was, thank God he didn't actually propose in the lab. Right? <laughs> so embrace it. He's now really happy and excited. This is one of my favorite scientists. Um, she's actually an engineer who became a doctor. We've heard a bit about that story. Her name is Catherine Moore, and she's in Silicon Valley. The da Vinci robot is a surgical robot that she helped invent. If you ever want to hear an inspirational speaker, Google Ka uh, Catherine Moore and TED Talks. She does TED Talks. But she's fantastic. Now, we've done projects with them. So it turns out with the da Vinci robot, you can't do surgery, bone surgery, um, at the end of one of those arms, because it's all about rotating through a really small keyhole incision. And it's hard to generate the pressure. And if you use it like a sawing motion, you generate a lot of heat. So we use laser pulses that are so exotic that they don't generate heat. And so we've had projects with them where we're designing exactly the type of laser pulse that you need, delivered at the end of a fiber, that we can snake down those robotic arms that you see there and do surgery for bones and sinuses and things. Really, really fun. So I run a lab called the Photon Factory. Um, I started out, when I was you guys, I was going to be a neurosurgeon. So I wasn't somebody who had trouble deciding what path I was going to take. I just changed my mind all the time. And so I was going to be a neurosurgeon. And obviously, I didn't wind up being a neurosurgeon. Now I run a laser lab, and I get to do all sorts of things, like probe the fundamental nature of light-matter interaction. I have a company that sorts sperm by sex for the dairy industry, so I'm actually occasionally in the newspaper. My team calls me the sperm queen. Uh, my kids, my boys, are a little embarrassed about that. Um, uh, and, but it's really, really fun. I study things like in your blood right now, you know, your blood is really red. That means it interacts really strongly with light. But you don't want it to do anything with that light. You just want it to carry oxygen from your lungs to your tissues. And so in your blood, the molecule, that hemoglobin, has designed evolutionarily the way to absorb all of that light and then get rid of it really, really fast. 50 millionths of a billionth of a second. Incredibly fast, very, very useful for us. This is our sperm sorting company. So it turns out for her to give milk, which is what the dairy industry wants, she has to have a baby. 
And, but not all those babies are the same. If you're a dairy farmer, you don't want a whole lot of male babies. You want to be able to turn the dial so that you get all females, and that's what we're trying to do. So this is what our technology looks like. So the chip in the middle there, we make using lasers and photolithography, it's called. It's, like, it's actually like jello mold. You know, we just make it in different shapes with tiny little features. The cells come in. We identify which ones are carrying an X chromosome and which ones are carrying a Y, and then we use a laser to move them into different channels. And I can show you how that works a little bit. So there's a laser coming down from the top, and there's particles coming in from the side, and you can see that when they go through our laser beam, they essentially get knocked into a different laminar flow stream. And if we put a Y junction, that means we can collect the ones that we want and leave the ones that we don't want there. That's really exciting. We now have a company that's commercializing that. So what do I do? You know, lasers, milk, and sperm, that's all of our applied stuff. That's really fun. So we study the really fundamental stuff, but we also get to have an impact. And for me, it's the people I work with. So this is a picture. Um, you guys might appreciate this. This is this time of year last year in New Zealand. It wasn't below freezing all week. Um, it, it's very green. Of course, we're in the southern hemisphere, so our seasons are reversed. Um, but these are the people that I work with. And for me, as a university scientist, this is actually what drives me. Um, we heard Varuna talk about following your values. I love working in a university. Because I, I, I'm, a, I'm like a point guard. In fact, when I played basketball, I was the point guard. I love passing the ball to somebody else and then clapping when they score. I don't need to be the one that's on the front. You know what I mean? And so, for me, a university job is all about helping these guys succeed. So actually, I've done three and four all at the same time there, right? So you're a nerd, and it's fun to explore being a nerd or an egghead. What's the number two reason? Well, the door is open. Okay, here's one of my favorite quotes. So this is a, a um, she was a professor at Maryland, and she said, you know, right now I have to go around obstacles to get where I want to go as a woman and scientist, but by the time my daughters are around, I want doors to be open. I want them to be able to go straight in. And the fact is, and this took me 15 minutes of internet searching, all of the programs that are out there, programs exactly like this one, that are helping you make connection, helping you talk to scientists, helping you discover what you want to do, and hopefully helping you realize that even though if you Google scientist, it's much better than it used to be, but it used to be that all you got were pictures of white men, that there is a place for you here. And so I would say the door is definitely open. It's up to you to walk through it. It's not going to be easy. Nothing that's worth it is. You know, and it's not like you're never going to have any trouble and you're never going to experience harassment or you're never going to experience bias. Of course you will. But it's up to you to go in and walk through that door and be persistent and get what you want out of it. And so the last thing I would say, the number one reason to be a scientist, and, and you've heard this a little bit from um, Rob, actually, is that you can make a difference. So there are lots of problems facing us right now, global problems. Clean drinking water. It's hard to believe, but there, there are many places in the world where you can't just turn on a tap and get a glass of water. We're running out of fossil fuels. That's actually kind of a good thing, because all the fossil fuels that we've burned have, have induced climate change. And so we've got problems with climate change that need to be fixed. We need to be able to harness energy from the sun better. All sorts of things. We need a more sustainable world. And that's where you guys come in. We can't do that unless people like you, you guys are the ones that are going to solve those problems, and we need all of you to be thinking about that and thinking about how you're going to contribute. So see, this is the face of the future, right? And that's where yours should go. And I think I'll stop right there. Um, down to the mic for, for questions for Catherine. Um, really inspiring talk. I love the, the hot guys <laughs> slide. Yeah. Um, um, so maybe just, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit, if I had a question for you, it would be just tell us a little bit about what it is that your work, what do you do? Like, we heard about the sperm and the dairy cows, but what does a <laughs> typical day, day look like for you? So a typical day for me actually doesn't involve, these days, a whole lot of time in the laboratory. So that's one of the weirdest things about having a science career in academics. You, you spend your time learning how to research and learning how to do all this stuff, and if you do well, you eventually get kind of promoted out of that. So my job these days is to help those guys succeed. I call it giving them brain candy. So we have tons of project in that space. We have people who are developing handheld sensors to identify skin cancer. We have people who are developing stress sensors. We have people who are studying how light and matter couples to one another. 
And my job is to help give them the tools that they need so that they can explore those types of projects themselves, help teach them what they need to know, help teach them how to be a scientist, and then essentially give them money and let them go. A couple of questions? Hi, so I'm Frizana, and I go uh, to Victoria Park. I just wanted to ask, like you said, uh, you mentioned how you had really empowering figures in your life that kind of motivated you throughout, and then, uh, but there might have been also negative reactions or comments. So what really motivated you personally to get inspired and stay, like, go on this journey that you went on? So um, I would say initially I was really motivated by the puzzle-solving aspects of science. Um, and a lot of my early science was really about trying to understand, I got fascinated at one point by how energy moves around. So, you know, light is a way to carry energy. It interacts with molecules and gets absorbed. You know, in, I mentioned the thing about the hemes. Um, that happens in your blood, but on your eye, that light gets converted to rotational motion. And so initially it was that pu pu puzzle solving side of it. I was really slow to recognize bias myself. And I think that's pretty common for people in my generation. Um, you guys are doing much better, and I think that's fantastic. Um, the people that helped me were the, the advisor that I had when I was a first year undergrad. You know, I said I was gonna be a neurosurgeon. I took this class and the professor said, you know, would you like to come do an internship in my lab? And I said, I, I don't know how to do that. And he said, of course you don't. You know, that's what we're here for. And so he supported me all the way. Um, I didn't have a lot of female figures at that time. Um, I, I, you, you know, you saw the invited speaker list, but I did have a lot of um, men who thought that I was really good at what I did and supported me. Now, that's not to say that I didn't have some negative times. You know, I had to remove someone from my committee because he literally chased me around the table. At a, at a, you know, I did a math problem right, and he's like, oh, that's great, and he didn't s stop. And then I got up and he kept, and I'm like, no, this is not on, buddy. You know? <laughs> um, but you learn how to deal with that, and you learn how to deal with that adversity. You learn how to understand that it's not always going to be smooth. You're not always going to be the, um, the kind of up-and-coming young thing that gets all the praise and the A's and everything, and you work through it. And it's, you know, I used to think that being smart was the most important thing in being a scientist, but I think actually it's about persistence and drive. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Eva, I'm from Waterloo, hi. Oxford, and I just wanted to know, um, what do you gotta do to be like a, a university professor or do research, and what's the difference between them? That's a really great question. So there are a lot of places where you can do research. So you can do research in labs, you can, like national labs, you can do research in companies, um, and you can do research at universities, or facilities like this, which isn't really a university, but is affiliated with one. And there's almost a spectrum um, in going from, say, uh, doing research in, in an industry, like if you were to go do research at BP Oil, versus, say, doing research at the Perimeter Institute, the spectrum is about how much flexibility you have in choosing what you work on, okay? And that's something you have to decide yourself. I am really bad at being told what to do. I, I'm, I'm not very good at it at all. It's something I had to recognize early, and so for me, university was a bit better than working in industry. But some people really love to do research. I have a, a guy in my lab right now who really loves to do that research, but he doesn't want to be me. He wants to have projects that are more laid out for him, and then he does it. Um, the path to getting to any of those places is to go first to university. Now, people will tell you you have to get a Bachelor of Science, but I'm standing here telling you that's not true because I have a Bachelor of Arts, and I took a whole lot of history. I took a whole lot of civilization, lots of languages. Um, not enough to get a Bachelor of Science. Um, you then do, uh, so, so do, if you want to go work in a company, you can actually, straight out of university, you can apply, and they can train you up, okay? That's a bit of a challenging path, and your trajectory will be a bit lower. Do you know what I mean? If you go, after you get your Bachelor of Science, and you do a Master's Degree or PhD, then you're doing a more self-directed body of research, and then your career trajectory is often a bit, it, it, you've got a bit more of an upward slope to it because you've got more training and more independent thought. Again, you can work at a national lab or, or a company or go into academics. If you want to become a professor, depends on where you are. Um, but there's typically a period of time where you're pre-tenured. So you go, you go do your PhD, you go do what's called a postdoc where you're working with somebody else, and then you go apply to, say, a university, you become an assistant professor or a lecturer, you work your tail off, and then eventually you get tenure and then you become a professor.
Thank Does you. that answer the question? Oh yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Paige, I go to GDHS, and my question is, what does, like, if you're working in a lab, what does a typical day in the lab look like? So, um, if it's like, say my team, one of my team members on Engender, which is the sperm sorting company, is working in the lab. Um, they'll come in, they'll have a set of problems that they've been thinking about. So, right now, um, one of the problems that we're thinking about is um, how to orient sperm inside of a microfluidic channel. Right? So it turns out sperm are really shaped weird. I, I didn't know this. I wasn't a sperm expert before I started this project. Um, and so 10 microns by 5 by 1. So a human hair is about 100, right, just to calibrate you. And then they've got a tail. And the way we tell the ones that have an X chromosome from the Y chromosome is we stain them, and then the X chromosome is a bit bigger than the Y chromosome, so the females are a bit brighter than the males, which I'm sure you will all appreciate. What that means, though, is that if the cell is really shaped funny, if it's coming at, like, say you guys are the thing that's measuring the fluorescence, the glow off of these cells to tell whether it's X or Y, if it's at you that direction, it's going to look really different from that direction, and that small difference between X and Y gets smushed out. So right now, my team is trying to just figure out how to better orient those cells inside these channels so that they can better measure things. And that means they go into the lab, they have a set of goals, big-term goals, that might be three months long, and then they have to figure out how to break that down into individual steps. That often means they have to build stuff, they have to buy stuff, they have to say, you know, hey, I need to try to put this in a different medium, or I need to change the shape of the microfluidic channel, and then they figure out how to do that. So it's really, really fun. It's, I like to think of it as Legos for grown-ups. Right? It's, you've got a kit, you know you want to build you know, the Death Star, but actually you really want to build a Death Star with feet because you want it to be able to walk a little bit on its own. And that means you've got to pull in other things and you've got to figure out how to make it robotic and so on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll take one last uh, question. Hi, I'm Hi. Brenna. I go to Vaughn Secondary. And you were mentioning at the beginning that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon, and then you had you were always changing your mind. So I was just wondering, how do you narrow down all those options until you found the one that you were truly passionate for? So actually, I thought the first speaker said it beautifully. You know, if, if I look back on my career, it looks like a straight line, because I see the decision points. If I look forward, it's squirrely like this, you know? And I would never change any of the decisions I made that didn't get me to where I Actually, that comes out totally wrong. All the decisions I made got me to where I am today. But I did things like I turned down a really competitive MD-PhD fellowship. It was, I don't think anybody's ever done that before because it's so competitive to get one. They give out like seven in the country or something. And I was like, no, I don't think I want that. And everybody thought I was making the wrong decision. Maybe I would make more money now. Maybe I'd be a famous doctor now. But for me, I love what I'm doing right now. I'm happy where I am. And that was the right decision. So you have to trust yourself, and you have to realize that when you make a decision and it looks like you've made the wrong one, um, you just think your way out of it. You don't, you don't ever stop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cather.